I am Franny from Hypothesis. I'm on the marketing team here, and I am so happy to be here and love this conference and love open annotation and just the amazing people who are taking part in it. And I'm going to turn it over in a minute to one of our amazing people, our moderator, Bo Dong Chen. Um, but I want to introduce our guest today as well. We have Jin Ran Zhu and Yanji Jung and Chris Andrews. And like I said, I'm super excited about this. And um, we are recording it. So if anybody ends up coming in late, they'll they can watch the beginning after the fact. So with that, I'm gonna be quiet and turn it over to Bodong. Thank you so much for the introduction, Franny. Hi, everybody. Um, hope you're doing well. And I know this is a international event attracting um, colleagues and friends from around uh, the globe. So I'm really happy to be here. And this is my second um, I annotate conference. Um, my first attendance was in um, three years ago, actually, in um, 2018 uh, in San Francisco. So really happy to be back to this community and to, say, to see the growth of, of work related to hypothesis and annotation. Um, my name is Bo Dong Chen. I am an associate professor from the University of Minnesota. And I see myself as uh, a learning scientist who um, does who does research on, on learning processes and also design technologies and pedagogical practices for for learning. Uh, so I'm happy to really see three interesting projects represented in this panel, and I will let our panelists introduce themselves, of course, and their project as well a bit later. Um, thanks, Yunan, for putting up the slides. Um, so our panelists, as Franny mentioned, um, Yung Ji Jun from uh, NYU, um, Xunan Zhu from Minnesota, University of Minnesota, and Chris Andrews from uh, University of Indiana. And I see there's, um, and uh, by the way, all of them are PhD students actively working on cutting edge research in the learning sciences or, and also in the uh, field of learning analytics. And I'm re actually very excited to uh, listen to their talks and, and hear from them about what they're doing, what are they designing, and what are they researching, um, and so on. So, and how, um, next slide, please, here. And this is a really a t a tentative agenda for this panel. And the structure of this panel will be for each panelist to spend 50 minutes to uh, present their work and then have a really quick uh, five minute Q and A uh, after their talk, and and in it, and after every panelist present their work, we will have a panel discussion. We will invite everybody to pose uh, questions uh, along the way, so that you know those questions will be uh, either addressed after their talk or uh, um, added to the final discussion. Um, so I hope that's. Um, uh, I believe we'll have plenty of time to really listen to each other and also to have a, a conversation during the panel. So without further ado, um, our first presentation will be um, from Xinran. Take this from here, Xinran. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Bodong, for the great introduction. So uh, my name is Xinran Zhu, a PhD student from University of Minnesota. And it's really a great honor to be here to talk about collaborative annotations. Um, in general, it's really a fun and great conference. I heard lots of inspiring voices from people from all different areas. And um, so for my interest, um, what do I do? I see myself as a learning science researcher and learning experience designer. I'm interested in learning analytics and design-based research to develop educational innovations and implement learning theories into the real world. So those ha also have been my guide to the study I'd like to share in a minute. So about a study, um, as we all know, hypothesis can support note-taking in many different areas. So today I'd like to share how it has been used in educational settings. So this study is based on our collaboration with college level instructors who were piloting the hypothesis tool. 
So we started this design-based research to support their integration and study how collaboration, uh, how collaborative annotations work in their classrooms. So here's the study, designing support for productive social interaction and knowledge co-construction in collaborative annotation. So I also would like to introduce our team here, uh, Hong Shui, who is also a PhD student at the University of Minnesota. She might be here today as well. And Bo Dong, uh, he's the moderator here, as you already know, and they all contributed a lot of wonderful ideas and efforts in this project. And yeah, and Shanna, and Bo Dong just uh, mentioned Shanna in the chat, has been supporting our um, study um, through um, at the beginning. So let's um, get started of the study. As you may see, a key element of the study is the design. So what is the design? Um, as a preview, we designed two scaffolding strategies to support teachers um, teaching and students learning. The first strategy is called the dynamic grouping strategy. So um, this first strategy, the purpose is to create or design a learning community as the first step. For example, when a class has really big size, like 100 students, um, the instructors may want to divide students into smaller groups, like 10 or 15 students per group. Um, this could avoid a student be overwhelmed by 100 annotations per rating. And another example could be um, the instructors may want to uh, assign different ratings to different groups of students so they can uh, later share their understanding of different ratings and um, achieve a higher understanding of the topics. And in general, this strategy will help the instructors to create a learning community at the first place and that can feed their teaching goal, the context and the community itself. And the second strategy is called the participation role strategy, which is also today's focus. So for this strategy, we want to provide an, an opportunity for students to take more responsibility of their own learning and support the process of their learning and to improve social interaction and knowledge co-construction. I'll uh, dive into uh, more details later about this strategy. So why did we design this study? Um, it was initially conducted at the University of Minnesota in fall 2020 when the campus shut down due to COVID-19. And then many instructors pivoted to online instruction and were looking for solutions. So based on our observation, there were generally two directions. The first, um, given the limited time, some instructor may want to, uh, by using some technologies or tools, to replicate their face-to-face -face ins um, instruction. Um, and then another direction would be um, they want to transform the student-teacher relationship by taking this opportunity. So this is where our collaboration started um, because we share the same understanding that um, the effective usage of technology requires the consideration on both technology and pedagogy. So um, we think there is a need to design meaningful scaffoldings when using technologies, um, sometimes even redesign of the curriculum instead of just throwing the tool directly to students. And by meaning pedagogy here, um, the pedagogies uh, drawn from uh, both theories and practice, such as the um, computer supported collaborative learning theory and some other learning theories. And based on that, we want to, um, through the design, let students take more responsibilities in learning. And we want to transform the dynamics between students and teachers embraced by the technology. And then we want to facilitate a natural space for social interaction and also engage knowledge co-construction in online learning. So about the study design, uh, we want to support collaborative web annotation in college classrooms by designing sophisticated um, participation roles. Methods we use is a co-design between researchers and instructors to design scaffolding roles and support their implementation with course-specific class customization. And we use hypothesis as the uh, social annotation tool. And this hypothesis um, in the current study has been in, um, integrated into the LMS system of UNN uh, Canvas. So the participants were from three fully online undergraduate classes in liberal arts 
And the focus of the current study is um, dance history class. Uh, it had 13 students and one teaching assistant and one instructor. So what is the design? What is the participation role strategy? Uh, in general, is a generic scaffolding framework comprising three scripted participation roles based on the um, computer-supported collaborative learning literature, which includes a facilitator, a synthesizer, and a summarizer. The facilitator is um, responsible for stimulating conversations by finding connections, seeking collaborations, and encouraging their peers to consistently tag their annotations for an entire week. And for synthesizer, they uh, usually synthesize the initial ideas, highlights agreement or disagreement, and suggest directions for further discussion in the middle of the week. For example, in the dance history class, in the middle of the week, there is um, um, synchronous class discussion via Zoom. So the synthesizer are, 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 were required to submit a paragraph or two or some nice bullet points um, as their synthesis before the class discussion. And during the class discussion, uh, students can have a further um, discussion based on the synthesis and other peers' annotations. And then for summarizer, they usually summarize group conversations at the end of the week based on both the class discussion and all the annotations for the whole class. And also at the end of the week for this class, um, every student were required to do a individual reflective writing. And all those roles and time frame can be adjusted by the instructor accordingly based on their own um, teaching goals and context. In order to study if the design worked or not work, we, um, we had two research questions. The first one is how did the activity design facilitate social annotation? The second is how did the design facilitate knowledge co-construction? So first we conducted a social network analysis to study the social interaction, such as the participation patterns in the collaborative annotation activity. Then we conducted a uh, content analysis to study the knowledge co-construction levels. So for the coding scheme we use is a revised interaction analysis model of collaborative annotation. We developed this um, coding scheme based on Gunavadurna's IAM model and on Rubia and Angle's model of collaborative knowledge construction. And we identified four levels of um, knowledge construction. The first one is called initiation, where students started to share initial understandings and ask questions and share resources without too much elaboration. And then it's called um, level two is exploration. When uh, in this phase, students started to elaborate on the text or contact personal experiences with some crit critical reasoning. And then level three is negotiation, where students started to ask a question through critical reasoning or negotiate disagreement or connect readings with critical reasoning. And um, the highest level, level four, is called co-construction. Um, in this level, students started to reach a consensus on the previous questions and they apply the knowledge or way of thinking. And also they can make metacognitive statement illustrating their learning outcome. So did the design work? Uh, in general, the answer is yes. For social interaction, as you can see from the table, the in-degree, out-degree means how many uh, replies or annotations they receive and or sent out. So the facilitators in general sent out more replies and they reached out to more peers and they also received more replies. And from the table, the betweenness, constraint, and dominance, they're all centrality measures. So the higher scores in betweenness and dominance and lower scores in constraint, meaning the students are in the center of this community. So the facilitators, they were always in, they were always influential in the collaborative annotation activities, which means they are always in the center position. And also the social interaction pattern varied across the facilitators in different weeks. And for synthesizer, they participated more than more than non-row takers in terms of the numbers of posts they sent out, but not as much as facilitators did, since they tended to focus more on synthesizing the readings and annotations on their own. 
And for some riders, they participated as same as non-road takers, which is also expected since the responsibility for them was to write the weekly summary on their own. And for knowledge construction, um, the facilitator, they generally ask questions or provided answers with elaboration, examples, critical reasoning to start and push the discussion. For example, here's an um, example thread facilitated by one facilitator. As you can see, the facilitator tried to connect other two students' um, annotations when replying to student A. And also the facilitator proposed some follow-up questions to engage thinking and uh, engage a deeper thinking. And um, for knowledge construction level also varied across the facilitators in different weeks. And for synthesizer, their post were also mostly classified into level two and level three in terms of the knowledge co-construction. While for summarizer, they on average contributed much less annotations in all levels. Most of their posts were in level two. This result uh, were in line with the script role in the scaffolding framework. For example, they uh, because they focus on the class discussion during Zoom meetings and composed the summary that connected Zoom discussion with annotations. So in general, the result indicated that to a great extent, the designed activity was enacted by students properly. And then the role assignment was associated with stu students' social interaction pattern to some extent. And different role takers may have different strategies when they're playing the roles. And most importantly, um, in weeks when role takers posted more higher level posts, the knowledge construction level from non-role takers tended to be high too. So um, implication of the design, first we proposed a scaffolding framework for collaborative annotation, which is applicable to many um, college level classes, including the both the dynamic grouping strategy and the participation role strategy. And then we developed a revised interaction analysis model for collaborative annotation that is more appropriate for analysis of students' discussion anchored in a web documents. This can also support teaching as a reference for evaluation of the annotations. Finally, the result of data analysis have shown promise of the designed scaffolding framework for facilitating um, productive collaborative annotation in a study context. In particular, the, faci uh, the facilitators and the synthesizers played roles in deepening collaborative annotation. So as for some final words, um, just to illustrate our um, purpose of the design, we believe effective usage of technology includes the um, consideration on both technology and pedagogy. So for pedagogy, students are not always natural collaborators and they need, we need to make intentional efforts to help them become better collaborators. And for instructors, they need to provide careful scaffolding and detailed guidelines for students to take various roles. And the technology also needs to connect students and teachers' needs to provide a natural and effective environment for collaboration. And there's a plus sign here. Um, I just wanna say that this plus sign doesn't mean the relationship between technology and pedagogy is linear. Actually, they impact each other at every moment. So the pedagogy can impact the technology design and development, and in return, the technology can impact the pedagogy in terms of such as curriculum design and the class um, uh, evaluation. So, um, so we need to go back to the fundamental questions to rethink the uh, relationship between pedagogy and technology. For example, when we call hypothesis as a note-taking tool, when we discuss how, discuss how to make better notes or how to support note-taking in a better way, we also want to go back to the questions that why students are taking notes and how are they going to use it in the future. So then we can think how um, we as researchers, designers, and teachers can do a better job to support the process. And as a final note, I also would like to invite everyone to rethink the relationship 
between technology and pedagogy and also between students and um, teachers, what can be done as researchers, designers, and teachers. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um, please let me know if you have any questions or suggestions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Xunran. Uh, I already see uh, or two questions in the Q&A section. Um, so the question is from Michael Welker. And uh, Michael was asking, on the assigned roles, were they uh, rotated across multiple assignments? Also, how much orientation was needed to define those roles for the students? Yeah, that's really a good question. So first, yes, the role will rotate. Each student will have opportunity to try each different roles. And each week there's one facilitator for one uh, for each reading, one synthesizer for, and one summarizer for each reading. And for orientation, at the beginning of the semester, uh, we, we actually, the, the instructors spend a lot of time to explain um, how the different roles are different from each other. And we kind of spend two or three weeks to try and to adjust the roles to kind of make a co-design, not even between researchers and instructors and also between the students. Because during the class meetings, the students also shared their understanding of the roles. Um, and then the students and the teachers adjust the role together. I, I think started from week four and um, all the roles have been settled down and the activity has been uh, smoother. And um, yeah, that, 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 that answer your question. All right. Michael says awesome. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Quick question for Yi Xunran. I see another question coming in from Shanna. Would you recommend using the framework level one to five for rubric for grading and or for scaffolding for students? I think uh, um, by framework, um, Shanna means the, the coding framework you used to analyze the code construction. Mm. Yeah, I'll go back to that slice. So um, this this coding thing has four levels. Um, I think it can be uh, work as a reference for um, grading or evaluation of students' annotations. But sometimes I'm hesitant about using some framework or coding scheme to grade students' annotations quality because it's really hard to um, to see if to identify if an annotation is, is a high quality or low high quality. Um, even when some students are in level one or level two, it doesn't mean they're not learning. Uh, maybe they're in, in some phases of learning or just their learning styles. But in general, I think it could be uh, used as a helpful reference for teachers to see how students are learning in a, in a specific week and how um, other scaffolding or uh, support need to need to be provided to the students. Great, Thank, thanks uh, for the questions and thanks for your responses, Shunan. Uh, I think we will have more uh, opportunities later after the presentations to engage in those questions again. And at this point, I want to thank you, Shunan, for your presentation and then invite thank Chris you to share your screen and, and give us your presentation. All right, let's see if I can get this to work here. Okay, so I, I have a somewhat weak connection uh, for those that are uh, listening in. I'm gonna try and uh, turn on my video for a minute. I had, to, I had to drive down the road to find a better uh, spot for my, um, for my phone to be able to hotspot in, so we'll see. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm in a car right now. It's also raining. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to uh, present with uh, these, these others. Um, Shinran, that was that was awesome. I love the um, what you've been doing. I've already seen your your scaffolding framework from uh, that you had posted up before. So I, I th think that's awesome. So what I want to present on today um, is this. This is kind of part of what I'm trying to do for my dissertation. Um, which is uh, thinking about kind of instructors and how they use it, um, how they use social annotation. 
uh, particularly within these undergraduate reading and composition courses, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so some of these, this is, these are some things that we kind of already know about uh, social annotation. Um, and, and Shinran talked about this, uh, that kind of with the pandemic, many people moved online, needed something to, um, uh, you know, kind of mimic uh, what they were already doing in their classes or, or just something to help them with their their online courses that move to online. And many turned to social annotation um, because it's this, this flexible tool that we can use even in a hybrid situation or even a, in a face to face. Um, and I, I love this quote from um, Remy Kalir and Antero Garcia, their new book on annotation. Um, that they mentioned that social annotation is seldom an end in and of itself. Rather, it most frequently complements a repertoire of other educational practices. So we need to focus on, you know, not just social annotation and what's happening in social annotation, but also kind of how it interacts with other things, uh, particularly within a course. Um, and so that's part of where I'm kind of thinking about this in terms of instructors um, and uh and then also what happens to these annotations once they're once they're created. Um, so uh, this also comes uh, again here. I'm, I'm quoting uh, Bodong and, and Shinran here uh, on their most recent article um, in the Information and Learning Sciences Journal that we need more in-depth qualitative inquiries into how instructors are using social annotation and these and this interaction of social annotation activities with other course activities. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So these are some of the questions that I'm thinking about um, as, as I'm, you know, trying to uh, understand, analyze, research. Um, you know, how do instructors implement social annotation in their online undergraduate reading and composition courses? Again, we'll get to the context here in just a second. What are actually what are instructors actually doing with the annotations? And then how do these social annotations um, impact or align with other course activities and, and course goals? Next slide. So uh, some of you may have, may already be familiar with this, um, but I'm I'm at Indiana University and Hypothesis and uh, the Department of English at Indiana University have partnered to uh, to do this this project. This really uh, so I'm, what I'm doing is a kind of a small part of this uh, long term project um, at, at IU, particularly with the uh, English W one thirty one classes. That's their freshman composition courses, um, reading, writing, and inquiry. But uh, part of the data that I'm looking at has to do with um, a couple other courses as well, this introduction to fiction and introduction to poetry courses. And I've got the nice little uh, COVID graphic there uh, that basically what happened is, again, as we all know, forced online um, because of the pandemic. And uh, so they started to implement, they've been using hypothesis in some of their courses. And when they started making this, this course shell for, um, you know, all of the instructors to use for English W131, the freshman composition course, uh, they decided that they wanted to embed hypothesis as part of this uh, and, and social annotation activities um, as part of this. So across all of these, uh, there's there's more than 50 sections of English W131 that are going to be using or that have used over this, this last academic year um, social annotations using hypothesis. Um, and so there's a, a lot of data that we're going to be sifting through and I'm just kind of piecing off uh, a little bit of this. No, that was actually perfect, but I, I, you like read my mind. Um, so spring 2021 semester, this is uh, where the data that I'm looking at uh, in particular, there's uh, several um, data sources. So uh, the, the semester started and we, you know we're, we're collecting kind of course activities that are happening, including their social annotation uh, assignments that are occurring throughout the semester, um, as, as well as other uh, assignments that they're working on. We had two instructor questionnaires, one at the beginning of the semester or near the beginning of the semester and one at the end um, to kind of get an idea of what instructors are doing with the annotations. And then um, I also facilitated what we called an instructor inquiry team. Um, it was really kind of like a mix between a focus group and like a professional learning group, professional learning community, um, where basically we just talked once a month-ish um, about uh, the decisions that they were making um, about uh, their social annotation use in the classroom. 
Um, what kinds of uh, intentional decisions were they making? Why were they making those choices um, in terms of how they were using social annotation or um, how they were, uh, you know, what they were doing with the annotations and that sort of thing. Um, and so you can kind of see that we've got kind of diff multiple time points all across the semester of kind of trying to understand what's going on. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, so I, I kind of mentioned this already, I guess that the, we had the two instructor questionnaires, um, uh, that the instructor focus groups, there was actually, there were six instructors that participated that we split into two, uh, two groups where we were doing these deeper dives. And then uh, those are part of the, the course artifacts. We were collecting these artifacts that, um, that the instructors created, but some of these artifacts were um, artifacts that students contributed to, even though it was a, a, a instructor created, and I'll, I'll mention that in, in just a minute. So we can go to the next slide. So uh, this is, I don't, I don't know how many of you are, uh, you know, college uh, football or, or basketball fans. Well, right as soon as the season ends, um, they come out with rankings for the next year, uh, even though nobody knows anything that's going to happen. And they typically typically call those their uh, way too early rankings. So um, uh, these, these are my, because I have not dived into the analysis yet. Um, this is uh, just kind of my thoughts as I've, uh, as I participated in some of this data collection. So I haven't really done analysis yet. So this is my way too early thoughts and analysis. Uh, so we can uh, keep going. I think, I think I have these down one by one. So I'll just tell you to go to the next piece or you, you can go to the next one actually. Perfect. So uh, instructors design of annotation activities as, and, and what I mean by this is that instructors, how they were thinking about using um, annotations, uh, and, and I, I have an or between these, but I don't necessarily mean them to be um, either or. Uh, it, it might be somewhere along probably a continuum of some kind, um, but some of the instructors were thinking about uh, the annotation space as a student only space, not really a space that they really participate in. They might provide some private feedback, for example, within Canvas, the, the, the LMS, um, because the hypothesis we were using, the hypothesis within the um, learning management system. And so some of the instructors were thinking about as a student only space, a space where the students didn't have to worry about um, the instructor uh, uh, making sorts of, uh, you know, judgments or comments on uh, in the public space, um, but there are other peers, so it's really kind of more of a space for peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Um, or some of the instructors were thinking about it as this kind of joint space where they could together um, make meaning. And so, again, there's some, and I, and I love how uh, Shinran put the, this idea of, you know, technology plus pedagogy, and these are some intentional decisions that these instructors are making, these pedagogical de decisions, as they're thinking about how they want to build this space and why they want to build that, the space that way. Um, and so that was just one of the interesting things that came out of it. And then there's this idea of individual engagement with the text or threaded conversations. What is, what is the goal of these social annotation activities? Is it in, in these reading and composition courses, for example, um, is our focus really on uh, analysis uh, of the text um, or, uh, and, and really kind of having that conversation with the text, or are we trying to uh, promote this, this threaded conversation, um, you know, focus more on the interpersonal or the um, community building ideas uh, within that. And again, not, not that these are mutually exclusive, you, you can do both, but just as the teachers are thinking about uh, how they want to approach the, the pedagogical uh, process and pedagogical decisions, they're thinking about some of these things. Uh, and sometimes they're focused more on, I, I need them to understand the text. And sometimes they're focused more on, I want them to build community or uh, share with each other understandings. Um, and go ahead and go to the next one, Bolong. Um, and then there's this idea of accountability and exposure to the text. This is sort of similar to individual engagement with the text, but um, some of the instructors are thinking about um, this idea of accountability uh, of, you know, is this just social annotation is maybe an easy way to find out if students read the text or not. 
Uh, and maybe that's all you need it to do. Um, obviously, I think many of us here in this uh, session and many of us that have used social annotation um, see other rich and, and wonderful uses for it. But also some instructors, all they really need is they want to make sure that the students have, have read the text and, and had been exposed to the text. And so some of them aren't thinking about um, this deeper power of social annotation. Um, or another uh, you know, part of this, and I see uh, Jeremy in the chat has mentioned kind of these tensions um, that uh, these could be portrayed that way, this, this idea of tensions that, or are they, can we use these social annotations as resources for future activities? Can we, um, and, and this was in particular, I'm thinking one of the instructors um, who was having students use uh, tags pretty heavily um, as they're reading, um, particularly relating it to um, conventions of a particular genre of, of writing. Um, and uh, then they would go into a Google Doc, a shared Google Doc, where students could go back to the annotations and they could search for these tags. Um, and then they could kind of add some information, okay, uh, this, or, you know, about a character or about genre, uh, a particular convention of a genre and, and start to build out this, um, I don't want to say a, a catalog. I'm trying to think, I need a better word for this, but um, they were kind of building out this, this new resource. So they were using social annotations as a resource to build a, a new resource for when they went to their essays, where they could kind of organize, they kind of self-organized all of these, um, all of their annotations in, in kind of new ways. Um, so again, just kind of some of these interesting tensions that some of these instructors were thinking about how do we use social annotation um, and, and how do we use them in different ways than maybe we haven't thought about before. Uh, and then going to instructors' use of annotations, um, you can go to go to the uh, next one. Uh, I think most of us are totally, we, we get this idea of preparing for class. Um, you know, many of them were using the social annotations. They'd go read their students' annotations to uh, prepare for uh, their, their next class. They would, you know, the they'd be due 24 hours beforehand or something like that. They would read through them um, maybe to see misconceptions or ideas from the text that the students missed. And a lot of times they could tell by what was what was annotated and what wasn't annotated that, you know, if they didn't annotate a whole section of the text that uh, the instructor felt like was really important, then they would, you know, bring that up in their in their conversations. Or some of them, uh, one of the students, um, you know, mentioned they, they used it as a warm calling on students in the sense that they knew a student had already made an annotation, had already said something about this. Um, and they would reference their annotation and maybe either ask them to expound on that or um, or maybe there wasn't uh, there weren't replies to that particular annotation in the social uh, space. And so they would in their synchronous session, um, they would uh, you know warm call on that student and and use that annotation as kind of a, a jump start for uh, further discussion. Um, obviously, there's part of this, uh, there, there's another tension here where we don't want to uh, rehash a conversation that has already been had in the social annotation space. Um, you know, we want to be careful about not having a redundancy of a conversation. Um, and so kind of trying to think about what what that might mean. Um, but uh, that it, we can still use the annotations in this, you know, in this other synchronous space as well. Um, and then this idea of public versus private feedback, I kind of mentioned that already in terms of this student only space versus um, the joint student instructor space. Um, but thinking about, okay, when do I make uh, public comments and when do I make private comments to students? Um, and, and just thinking about that, uh, that dynamic and, and trying to identify when, wh at what point, uh, or you know, what is happening in the annotations that I'm gonna make a public comment versus a, a private comment where I'm gonna go into the, the annotation space where all the other students can see it, or I'm just gonna do it within the, the Canvas LMS and um, you know, give them some, some private feedback on the assignment, for example. So, Again, I reiterate that these are way too early thoughts and analysis that uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into it more this summer. Um, 
and uh, being able to have some some more specific uh, and uh, much more backed up by data and quotes and and other things that I can link to 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 uh, promote the trustworthiness of what I'm saying. So this is this is just from the top of Chris's head based on his participation in uh, collecting the data. Um, but uh, I think some of these things are, are interesting and, and uh, hopefully will bear some, some really, uh, some more really interesting data. Um, and I think that's, the, I think that was my last slide there. So I think I'm, I think I'm done. All right, this is fascinating, Chris. I already saw uh, some really interesting conversation going on in the chat. All right, I see uh, something popping up. Um, so Yongji asked the question. Do you want to just directly ask to Chris? Yeah, sure. Uh, Chris, thanks for a wonderful presentation. And I really enjoyed your presentation, but I have a question or your personal thought about the potential impact of different uh, areas of content. Like your classes were in English, but what if uh, like, we are designing such as like STEM courses, such as physics or statistics, like their reading materials are really different from uh, English or like social sciences. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, let me think. Um, uh, I know I, I have a, um, I have a, a brother-in-law who uh, teaches um, physics and he's, he's used another social annotation platform that I won't mention because it's not hypothesis and this is a hypothesis event, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I know hypothesis is all for uh, any kind of social annotation, but um, he, uh, he, he talked about, and, and, and we know from some other, some other places like, um, uh, oh, well, now I'm forgetting. There's the, the, the website where you can see experts annotations on um, uh, some science content, science in the classroom. Is that what it's called? I think. Um, so I, I, I think there's some really uh, there's there's some really great uh, ways that we can uh, I, I see that annotation can be different in terms of you know there's the, there's the disciplinary side of it right that um, mm -hmm. so for example I was talking about the tags you know genre conventions within English you know is a specific thing but thinking about how what kinds of uh, tags you might use in uh, you know, a science or a STEM situation um, to help students organize some of the knowledge that they're, you know, co-creating or, or, or recognizing. Um, the other thing I was thinking about that, you know, English is, is primarily text-based, right? But when we get mm -hmm. into STEM, um, and maybe that's an overgeneralization of English. So there's uh, maybe uh, Jeremy, who I know has an English background, might, might take some issue with that. But um, that I'm also thinking about like graphs and mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know other other kinds of figures that um, annotation and on those kinds of um, those kinds of representations um, I could see being you know quite a bit different uh, than you know thinking about a, a paragraph um, and trying to make sense of a paragraph and and connecting to a paragraph, but the this idea of data analysis, um, you know, of these these figures or, or things like that. Those are just some of the things that come to my mind. Um, I feel like maybe I didn't. Did I did I address your question? I feel like we we kind of tend to. I tend to go off just a little bit there. Yeah, I, I feel like you address the potential like considerations that instructors might consider in terms of like uh, like. Uh, the annotations and interaction can be mediated by, not only by the English text, but also by like graph or like formulas or the others in STEM courses. So, yeah, you address it. Thanks. Yeah. And, and again, I think I, the, one of the key things that I, I think is just so important, and I think this gets a little bit to that, that quote that I shared earlier um, of this idea that social annotation um, you know, it is seldom an end in and of itself. That's <clears throat> just getting students to, to socially annotate is, uh, you know, might be fun and interesting for students, but unless it's tied to some sort of course goal or um, it's helping us achieve some sort of, uh, you know, other objective, um, you know, and you mentioned this idea of mediation, right, that mm -hmm. we want to think about not only how does social annotation, you know, mediate uh, our accomplishment of some of these goals, but 
then how do those social annotations then become mediators for other activities mm -hmm. in the course? Um, and so that's part of what I'm thinking about. Like if we, we need to make sure we, we start with that or, or consider those goals. So what, what goals are the instructors trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. And then how does, you know, do these social annotations? Um, how can they impact that? And then now we can start to think about, okay, how am I going to get students to create the kinds of social annotations that are going to be most useful for them to accomplish this, you know, it could just be an essay, but it also might be some other really interesting projects that they're uh, that they're they're working on. So those are just some of the things I'm thinking about. Great. Thank you, thank you both for for the conversation. Uh, I see another question from Shana, but I think at this point uh, I will save that question for the later panel discussion because I think that's relevant um, to a lot of the project we already see. And now I want to invite Yumji to share your screen and and share your work to us. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Could you see the screen? Okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Yeonji, and I'm a PhD student at NYU. And I think it's a nice trans transition from uh, Sin Lang and Chris's presentations to my one, because uh, my one is more about in what ways it, we could support uh, quality and better social annotation activities by using another intervention. Like social annotation itself can be a learning in intervention, but I wanna add one more layer to that so I can introduce that idea. So today's presentation is mostly about um, suggest this uh, idea and conceptualization of what I mean by data informed action or like what I mean by data informed feedback, which can be used to support. Sorry, uh, better participating in social annotation activities. OK, so uh, I think uh, everyone here is very interested in social annotation, and we are very understanding why social annotation uh, engagement is very critical. but. Uh, by limiting this into a higher education context, especially for the course activities. I wanna say uh, quality learning engagement matters a lot for student success in higher education. And so, especially in NYU, there are several uh, courses that apply social annotation tools to course activities to help students uh, better success in, high, in their courses and also better understand the course concepts. Then what kind of effective learning would be occur with social annotation? We can think about three different dimensions about it. So the first thing is by using social annotation, students can e interact with peers which can be an additional ways for their learning activities and also get exposed to diverse uh, views and um, uh, increase their uh, perspective beyond their, beyond their previous ones. And another way is um, by participating in social annotation, students can increase their additional participation in course activities, as well as uh, additional uh, social annotation activities, and also put more effort to complete their learning task, which uh, we can say by behavior engagement. And of course, by participating in social annotation and reading the materials and reading other students' ideas about the same text, students can deepen their understanding about the course contents and also formulate new inquiry or uh, argumentations. So students can increase their conceptual and cognitive engagement in the course. But uh, if there, if uh, if here uh, there are instructors for the courses who are using social annotation, uh, you could see there was a lot of low quality annotations, and also students showed a very uh, diverse level of engagement, commonly reported, also in the literature. So then. My question is, how can we design learning support where students can effectively engage with social annotation, uh, which have been expected to help students? So one way I want to introduce about it is providing learning, uh, providing kind of the learning analytics dashboard 
but I don't want to use the term dashboard because dashboard is more like very sophisticated term. But the main idea about here is what if we provide uh, uh, providing kind of the feedback or weekly summary report that summarizing students' uh, engagement progress in social annotations. So because uh, when we when students in when students participate in a uh, hypothesis, students produce a lot of different data sources, such as annotation contents themselves and clickstream data about when and how, when, uh, when, and who, uh, who and who put annotation and other metadata. So, if we make use of these different data sources and create a important feedback that can help students to take actions to improve their social their engagement in uh, social annotation activities or also change their mindset to better engaged in social annotations it might be great so my general idea here is how could we make use of the uh, social annotation data and how could we create a great feedback design so the expected uh, expected outcome is by using this data informed feedback, not only students, but also instructors can get a better sense of what students are doing and how students are engaging in social annotations. And uh, like compared to A reading material, B reading material got, get mo most attention. So this kind of quick diagnosis can be available. And also based on that, instructors can provide intervention to particular students who seemed uh, in need or problematic. And also instructors can change the order of the reading materials or take away a specific material, or they can change uh, this kind of um, modification in instructions. But uh, going back to students. So students are actually uh, not only the primary source of this learning data, but also they can be the main target for this feedback. So the information gener generated by students themselves can be fed back into students themselves to help them to take actions for better uh, social annotation engagement or also can help them change their attitudinal or motivational changes in social annotation. And the main reason about we are focusing on this action taking and motivational change is that uh, I have been uh, participating in several graduate level courses in NIU, we, which uses a hypothesis and other social annotation tools such as perusal. Uh, but students mainly sometimes dislike just the use of social annotation. They sometimes uh, perceive these activities as additional things that burden their coursework. So we want to see, but we always, be, but the instructors see, see the high value of using social annotations for students to better conceptually engage in course topics and also increase the interaction between students, not only as um, in offline, but also in the online spaces. So then what, what kind of action takings can be possible based on this kind of feedback? So based on the literature, so there can be three different kinds of actions. So awareness can be part of action as, or as a prerequisite for action. So by looking at what is showing about their progress in, in social annotations, students can, um, can be better aware of their status of learning and also get, they can reflect on what they are doing good or what they are having problems in their previous weeks uh, social annotation activities or if we could provide uh, the peer references or the classes average or classes um, data then students can also monitor their and their classes progress together and they can be better motivated to keep engaging in social annotation. And also um, by looking at the feedback, 
students can also increase their intention, attention to the course and materials, and also they can um, be more responsible for social annotation activities later. And also they can actively be listening to and speaking in annotations. And they can also change their um, argument, argu their, their way of participating in social annotations when they actually look at what they are doing in the social annotations, such as they can develop uh, argument or they can change their positioning in the threads or they can develop uh, the new questions or change the questions. And the most, um, most cited uh, actions or actually the help and resource seeking behaviors. So by looking at the feedback, students can further go to instructors by asking uh, what kind of additional resources I can see or what kind of, uh, or just asking the help to better understand the reading materials that they were not good at in social annotation at that week. Or they can also stretch they can also manage or plan their, their way of participating in social annotation in a more strategic way. However, we all know that just simple exposure to data is, does not always lead to meaningful awareness and actionable insights. And going back to that, students always, when they got the data informed feedback, they, have, they can be challenged in figuring out what to do with this and also students are usually reluctant to make decisions or take actions to improve social engagement based on this because they don't know what to do or they were just afraid of using that. And by the literature, uh, this kind of um, misconnection is, came from students mistrusting data. Even though the data itself shows their progress, some students say, it's not my data, it's out of sync, or it's not uh, showing my true uh, progress. And also students are usually having less experiences in looking at their own learning data. So this kind of um, deficient, uh, deficit experiences help them to reduce their confidence in making sense of what the data tells about them or what to do with them. So, and also usually those feedback tools, especially uh, the dashboard, usually focused on awareness or monitoring rather than helping students to, rather than prompting students to do something after, the, after looking at the feedback. So then my, other uh, question is then, okay, so we all know this kind of uh, potential uh, exciting opportunities, but also we know the challenges. So how do we design actionable data and foreign feedback? So uh, my positioning about that is the most problems of challenges in making use of the previously developed feedback is usually from either the researcher side or just the developer side or uh, not including students or not including teachers for designing process. So I wanna suggest the co-design um, conceptualization for developing the, this kind of feedback tools and also involving teachers for that. So what I mean by co-design with students is to design and characterize the values or analytic metrics and tool features that can help students to uh, take actions in a way to improve their social annotation activities. So we think this kind of way can be helpful because it, this can address several ethical per aspects of learning analytics, what I hear say LA from students' perspective, um, by involving students in designing um, this kind of co-design process, students can develop their awareness of what kind of data from social annotations can be collected. And they can also increase their agency in their privacy control, and they can increase their trust in, of data use. And also, uh, we want to get some idea about how to make a balance between um, letting them know about we will gonna collect your data and then gaming behaviors happening and how could we make a balance about it. So uh, we wanna have some broad idea about iterative co-design sessions. So 
First, we can start from needs and problem an analysis that students have, especially about social annotation engagement. So we need some the real uh, experiences from students. And by listening to them, uh, we, we can uh, make students to develop and formulate a set of values, which they think very critical for effective engagement with social annotation. So what I mean by values here is, for example, oh, I think uh, providing um, question is very important for social annotation activities, then this kind of questioning can be one value. And like constant interaction with peers is very important, then that can be another value. So by setting up the values, we can think about later then what kind of analytic metrics students really wanna see. So for example, it can be uh, like the graph showing uh, the progress of their great quality of uh, this, this um, questioning development, or it can be just a, uh, it can be written by a text, just one text of, oh, you are doing good in this week. So we want to get some real uh, perspective from students about it. And then as a final stage, we want to help, help students to develop the and prototype the final tool, which we expected to give, produce as kind of the weekly report or as a like HTML version that visualize a set of metrics and with explanations. And in addition to that, we also think it's very, very important to involve instructors in, de in designing the course activities of using this kind of data informed feedback as part of the social annotation activities. Um, so we think this is another step for designing. So the purpose of doing that is to we, we get more, we wanna integrate students use of data informed feedback activities into core, core course activities and therefore students can increase their awareness and action taking in a way to help them better participate in social annotation. So integrating students use of feedback is very critical for them not only to revisit the tools but also make use of the feedback tool for their social annotation engagement. So we kind of suggest four different uh, principles from the literature. So the first one is uh, we can start from needs and problem analysis for implementation. And then we need to think about integration piece, which is how to incorporate this feedback use into core course activities tied to course goals. How can we introduce this uh, feedback into students and so and by and another piece is uh, how to implement this feedback to increase students agency in their own learning not only just introducing the tool and just letting them um, use and just observe what they are doing we really want to see how students make use of this feedback into their own learning and um, the next piece is about dialogue so based on the literature it has been very critically argued that it is very important to being transparent, especially in uh, implementing this kind of analytic feedback or learning analytics dashboard to students. So in what ways to inform students of the availability of uh, their data collection and how to get uh, agreement about it and how to inform students of the existence of this feedback. So. Uh, being a transparent way is really important and also in a way to facilitate dialogue for their social annotation engagement between students and instructors. So what I expect is also to see how instructors and students make a dialogue and conversation mediated by this feedback. So then the, the next thing we can think about is, okay, so all of the great imaginary ideas, then how could we imagine how effective this design would be or how could we analyze its impact or how could we think about in what way students make use of it? So uh, I have several questions here. So the fundamental questions about data for feedback is, bring social annotation activities, do students really benefit from looking at their own data? 
and how do students feel about it. So maybe uh, as an audience, you might think about, oh, okay, this is a good idea, but I'm not uh, fully uh, buying this idea because it can be also additional burden for students. So I think um, it's important to check and confirm that students can benefit from looking at their own data and in what ways we could improve this tool in a way better benefiting students. And another point to think about is from learning awareness to actions for uh, improvement, improvement in social annotation activities. So how do they, how do students make sense of what the feedback tells about their learning is a very critical question to see and whether and how students translate what they find in the feedback into actions they want to take for further um, social annotation engagement and then in what ways. And of course, uh, as I introduced several sets of specific actions, I also really want to see specific affordances about how does this experience help them take actions for facilitating their engagement annotations, like awareness, um, like adaptation, or attention, like what kind of actions do they take? And how does this experience finally impact their learning attitude in the course, and also motivation in social annotation further? So. Uh, because uh, the reason why I present uh, these kind of uh, uh, conceptual contents is I'm not conducting any study yet, but we are working on uh, implementing this interesting design to the classes in the upcoming bar, with, in, to the courses, to, in two courses which use hypothesis or other social anno annotation tools for their courses. So we really want to implement this design and see what happened and why something did not happen, will not happen. So our uh, my general idea about it is first uh, implementing social annotation activities to students like by having them equally participate in the reading materials using hypothesis and then see in what ways they can uh, get the data informed feedback and also how could they make use of it by interacting with them. And then after that, I wanna see what kind of impact happening during the term and also at the end of the term. So yeah, this is kind of the general model that I have in mind about how to designing and supporting the um, actionable social annotation engagement in, in courses. So yeah, uh, this is the end of the presentation. So feel free to ask me questions or uh, also if you have any questions later, uh, feel free to reach out to me using my emails here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Yongji. I see a round of virtual applause and heart uh, for your for your talk. Um, this is great. And I invite um, colleagues who are attending this to post questions in the Q&A or raise your hand if you want to ask Yongji a question directly. I see another already a question coming from Jeremy, which is, uh, is implementation, whether it's a typo oh. or not, I don't know. <laughs> or information or data informed yeah. feedback, personalized report of your study going to be produced by you or by social annotation tool? So, yep, uh, I think that's a good question for clarification. So yeah, it's actually both. So first, what I'm trying to do is uh, summarize a set of the data sources that can be uh, measured by or collected by the hypothesis tool or other annotation tools and provide students a set of these kind of uh, potential data sources and then make them uh, produce uh, the design or ideas for what would be interesting data sources they want to see to improve their social annotations and what kind of uh, analytic metrics they want to see in the feedback report. And after doing that, I want to make them develop some idea about what the report would look like. And then as a final, uh, step, I want to produce uh, the report with instructors and me together. So definitely it's not just made by the social annotation tool, but uh, I have some idea about it because uh, the 
um, the other social annotation tool uh, such as Perusal has some automatically produced analytics, but it's not for students. It's usually for the teachers and it's for grading. So they allow automatic grading, which, uh, which the instructors can use, but students cannot see at all. So yeah, do I answer your question? Okay. I think so. I think um, yeah. that's a great response. Uh, any other question? Quick clarification question for Yongji before we move on to the panel discussion. And um, I don't see more questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, at this point, I think um, I want to thank all three panelists for uh, your wonderful presentations, and especially um, thanking you for sharing your ongoing dissertation research. I think that's a very, um, very generous view to share your ongoing thinking, which is really inspirational uh, to me. And I see a lot of um, connections across different projects and, and shared um, investment in a few um, principles such as co-design or centering um, uh, what we know about learning and teaching and also the researcher uh, instructor partnership. I see that across all three projects as well. And um, so I have some questions. I want to invite you to think with us. And I also want to encourage the audience to post your question to the panel. You could direct your question to the, uh, everybody on the panel, or you could direct your question to a specific panelist uh, as we launch this panel discussion. So my first question, as I was really thinking about the, the design element that is cutting across different projects, um, the question I want to ask is, because you do work directly with instructors or uh, with students, I want to learn from you um, a little bit more in terms of how do you see the instructors contributing to the design or the design product in your project, which could be a framework or a, a student dashboard or tool? Um, and, and any tips you have that you can share with the audience in terms of ways to really engage the, the instructors to be active co-designers or contributors to your design. So feel free to jump in when you have a uh, we have a thought to share with the audience. Um, I can go first, if that's OK. Um, so I would say, I think instructors, they're really a key element during our collaboration because they're experts of teaching and the curriculum design. So first, as we collaborated, I would say uh, we all have shifted our um, identities a little bit. We're, we're not just researchers and they're not just educators. We all became the um, research-informed practitioners as we're all trying to turn research into practice by co-designing the social annotation activities. So um, during our design, we have co-design meetings and then they shared their course objectives, their insights and their um, teaching strategies. Then based on that, we um, introduced some scaffolding activities and collaborative learning strategies from the, um, the research literature. And I also really appreciate the strong rapper we have uh, established during our collaboration. I think that's really important. So throughout the uh, semester, we kept our routine design meetings as a chance to share both um, positive or negative updates and solve problems together. So our co-design has always been an um, ongoing process. It's not just we designed the activity at the beginning and never talked again. So there are always great ideas coming from the design meetings throughout the semester uh, with the instructors, and they have inspired us a lot as well. So I think the for the tip, I think the first step is to build the partnership um, and respect and listen to their needs, insights, and confusions as um, we are here to solve a problem together. Yeah, that, that's my thoughts. Thanks, Xinyan. Anything to uh, add, um, Yongji and Chris? Yep, 
Oh, I can add. So uh, Xinglan shared a great uh, insight about how to uh, like the importance of involving instructors in the whole process of designing and uh, implementing uh, the specific intervention for social annotation activities. And I wanna uh, add some another layer about the importance of involving instructors or teachers in not only designing the intervention itself, but also another work for designing the integration work to the course. So in my case, I wanna um, not only not only make students participate in social annotation activities, I also wanna do another experiment of uh, put, uh, introducing the the data feedback to students. So in that case, usually instructors have been not involved in the implementation project, but rather, af um, af rather instructors are usually involved in designing the tool of this kind of report or feedback, but they were not leading the main role, uh, reading role of introducing this kind of data to the class or students. So from my uh, pilot study, not involving social annotations, but in overall discussion activities, uh, students were really wanted to see see that instructors really emphasize the importance of why we are using uh, social annotations or why we are using the discussion post and how my activities really uh, really impacts my grade or my future career, et cetera. So I think it's really important for us to help instructors uh, continuously participate and uh, make interventions during the semester during the course of the semester by mentioning the, the purpose or importance of why using uh, the using social social annotation tools or in my case also why using data feedback for social annotations yeah yeah and i, I loved that um yonji and shinran both you know emphasized in their presentations this like this co-design idea with instructors because um, I, I mean, I, I'm thinking about a couple of things like one uh, coming from, you know, what we know about learning and, and uh, you know, learning sciences is that context matters. And uh, the instructor is typically the one who understands the context the best. And so when we're trying to um, design or understand what's going on, uh, I mean, obviously students or whoever's in that in that context is going to understand it better than the outside researcher typically. And there are other approaches that we have, such as research practice partnerships or um, implementation research, or there's other kinds of approaches that we can take um, that kind of involve their voice more in the research. But um, I, I, I think it is so important to make sure that we're getting instructors' voices in uh, in in this because uh, some a lot of times they're they're left out of this you know we focus so much on students because uh, we we want to make sure that students are learning um, but instructors can give us so much insight on uh, on what is going on in the classroom and little little things that we might not think about that are really important for that particular context I'm also probably quite biased uh, I come from a, a practitioner background I taught high school uh, for seven years before starting my PhD and. Uh, I really love teaching, and so there's there's a background part of that as well. And the other, the other thing I want to mention with um, with mine that I, I kind of I kind of said this that the instructor inquiry team, these focus groups that we had, that um, I tried to I intentionally designed it as a uh, sort of a professional to mimic sort of a professional learning community or professional learning group with the instructors that I didn't want it to be. I'm coming in and I'm going to ask you some questions and you're just going to answer. But we started each session with what, like what's going on with annotations in your class? Like what are some challenges that you're having um, with annotations that you want to talk through with the group? Because we had other instructors who had been using annotations. And so I wanted that space to also be kind of for them to just, uh, yeah, have, have this learning community to be able to say, you know what? Um, and, you know, one of there were two specific instances that made me feel like, OK, I, 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 
I don't know if I accomplished it hundred percent, but at least uh, some of the instructors saw this as, as a great opportunity. Cause one of them said, you know, a lot of my students are just doing these one-off annotations. There's not a lot of threaded conversations happening. What are other people doing to have threaded conversations? Now that was also, you know, one of, you know, a potential research question or something I wanted them to talk about. But instead of me coming up with that question, they already had questions and I kind of let them lead that discussion. And then another one um, where I said, okay, here's the general topic that we're going to talk about in this session. And uh, one of the instructors, the first thing he said uh, in, in the session was, um, I'm so glad that you posed this question because I've, I've never thought about this before and I want to talk to everybody about it. Um, and so I, I, I thought those were um, kind of just a couple of instances that made me realize, yeah, th like this is like for the research part, that's great. Like I want to make sure that I'm getting, um, you know, good data for my dissertation, but also I want to make sure that this is useful to the instructors and getting their perspective and having them, uh, you know, talk through some of this can really bring some rich data um, that because they're invested in it now, that they're, uh, you know, they want to have some of these conversations. And so because they're invested, uh, it makes for much more interesting uh, data and uh, it also benefits them. I wanted to make sure that, you know, part of this is it's benefiting these instructors. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really good strategy to think about the community, uh, Chris. I really love the strategy and we'll try to find a way to incorporate that in our future work as well. And, um, I'm looking at the time and I, I want to really invite the audience to, if you have any question for the panel, to uh, ask the question um, in the chat or directly raise your hand. I see uh, some um, um, some chat, really interesting conversation going on in the chat thread, which is great. And, and for me, since there's no more question, I'm really going to take the adv advantage of being uh, as, as a speaker on the panel. Uh, because I've been really thinking about this question myself and want to really listen to the panelists as well is, we use the term social annotation quite often in different contexts, right? And as a, as a researcher myself from the learning sciences, we emphasize social, cultural, and political dimensions of learning uh, besides cognitive and so on, right? There's multidimensional phenomenon. Learning is a multidimensional phenomenon. So I want to really engage the, audience, uh, the panelists and ask the question, what do you think about when you listen or use the, word, the term social annotation? What types of, um, what do you mean by social? Or, or how would you interpret the, the word social when you, th uh, when you think about social annotation? Because I'm really curious about your thoughts on, on this. So I can, if, oh, yeah, sorry. yeah. Um, when I think about this term social and when I use the term social annotation, I was also thinking what social I mean, I mean by, because I think uh, like this social annotation can be also widely used as like online collaborative annotation or online um, um, like collaborative discussion uh, text or something like other, there are so many different things. So my answer is, I think it can be divided into three different factors. So one is uh, by the, how, in what ways um, the collaboration is, and, uh, is mediated by. So the first thing is learner and learner, like, of course, being social means making interaction between peers or between the learners. But I think it's uh, like uh, social annotation is also individual activity at some level as the other uh, audience said before. So I think it's also more about learner to context interaction. So like learners can interact with the concepts and um, the materials themselves or text or topics in a more conceptual way. So I think that's the second thing. And the third thing is also a uh, learner to instructor, a learner to teachers. So uh, I think it depends on uh, how much instructors wanna involve in the annotation because usually some instructors do not want to uh, participate in annotation at that much. But if yes, then uh, I think also getting scaffold from instructors 
you know, better way to fully understand the concepts in the materials or uh, get exposed to new ideas from instructors is also another thing I can see as a social thing. Thanks a lot, Yunji. Xinren, you can go next. Okay. So yeah, I, I really like how Yunji um, kind of emphasized the connections between the students and teachers and the context. And I have a really similar ideas. And first, I think uh, social, of course, does not mean students are just talking to each other or discussing things all the time. But in the social annotations context or the learning context, the social needs to be uh, needs to support learning. So it's not just two people work socially, but their mind or cognition associated to the learning context are communicating socially. So sometimes I like to call it social cognitive learning, which means um, what, which means we expect there will be a cognitive achievement like understanding of the topics or application of the knowledge facilitate, facilitated by the social activity. And um, also for my understanding of social learning or social annotation, students don't just learn for themselves, but also they take the responsibility to contribute to the community by sharing their voices and helping others to understand the topics. But as I said, students are not natural collaborators um, they're not natural social cognitive beings as well. So uh, when we talk about social annotation, uh, we need to uh, keep in mind that there, uh, there needs to be a sophisticated design or support to help them um, achieve the goal. So in conclusion, I think social is something like an uh, ecosystem. Um, in social annotations, all students, our teachers, will take the, their shared responsibilities to contribute to the uh, to the community's knowledge co-construction, that's my understanding of the social. Yeah, and I, I don't I don't know that I would add much more. I thought those were both uh, really lovely. Um, that I really like this idea of you know that we can't we don't want to lose the the learning aspect of it um, in in the work that we're doing in particular. And so, um, I, you know, I like that idea of. Uh, you know, think about that, the co-construction of, of knowledge in, in this space. And that comes from these intertextual, intersubjective uh, connections that we're making um, as we're annotating. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't think I have anything else to. Yeah, I conquered. Those are really good, great points. Um, I think really adding a lot of richness to what we think about social annotation and I think about the future work that's uh, in front of us as a as a community. If I could use this term to describe our social annotation research um, community, I think there's a lot of work to be done, and really appreciate all of you sharing your work. And I hope to uh, learn as uh, your projects move forward. And with that, uh, we are five minutes over, and I want to thank all the panelists for your uh, contribution to the panel. And also thank you uh, to uh, thanks to the uh, attendees uh, for participating in this panel. Uh, Franny, uh, anything from you you want to uh, let us know or uh, kind of housekeeping things to um, um, to share with the audience? Um, hold on, I'm going to make it so that I'm on the screen. There we go. I have the power. Uh, no, I just, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to encourage people, you know, to follow this incredible work that you all are doing. And again, thanks to everyone who's here. And um, we should probably wrap this up so that people can get to some of the next sessions. Um, check the schedule, hang out in the lounge, meet people, talk to people, and don't forget about annotate this party. Later today, it's the penultimate one. Uh, it's going to be great. I got something kind of big planned for that. So anyway, that's another topic. Thank you again. And uh, yeah, we'll wrap this up. All right. Sounds good. Take care, everyone. It's so great to see you. <laughs>